Well, I'd like to welcome everybody to the March uh, Oregon City Business Alliance uh, Forum. We have a very fascinating speaker and topic this month. Um, the, the different personalities of all the players that are involved in the land use and land supply process. And actually having been in land development for a little over 35 years, I can personally attest that you see the different personalities of people at different times. It, it really is quite a, an event to attend some of these land use public hearings. Uh, <laughs> that was our mayor, by the way. <laughs> uh, so Joseph is gonna kind of break down today for all of us. It's gonna be very informational, but it's also gonna be very entertaining. What every aspect or different entity that's involved in that process, from the property owner to the developer, to the neighborhood associations, to the planning staff, to the city council or, and planning commission, you know, what it is that they're trying to accomplish and what it is we're trying to end up with as a final product after we've gone through that entire, uh, from beginning to end, uh, transformation. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to recognize some of our elected officials that we have here today. Uh, Mayor Holliday, thank you for coming. Mayor Gamba from Milwaukee, thank you for coming. Uh, we were, we did have a sign up. Oh, I missed you again. <laughs> I, you always sit over here in this corner and I always miss you. I, well, I, I need to be, make sure that I do that, Lou, from now on. Yeah, Mayor Lou Ogden from Tualatin. Uh, let's see, we have our police chief, Jim Band, here today. Uh, former Mayor Dan Fowler and let, County Commissioner Brian Shaw. Or, excuse me. Last month I had you as mayor. <laughs> you're, you're getting moved up because, if you remember, Brian, last month I did announce you as the mayor. So... <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get it straight. <laughs> I'm not sure you'd want that job, to be honest with you. Um, let's see. Oh, and, oh, there's Sonia. I knew that you were going to be coming. I saw where you were signed up and County Commissioner, uh, the newest one to join us, Sonia. Uh, so that uh, fills out now that they have five complete up there. So, a uh, beautiful buffet as always. I hope everybody's enjoying their meal. Uh, so, with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over here to Joseph and let him start his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. <clears throat> okay, how's that, everybody? Barely? Okay, I'll lean in a little bit. Uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, I'd like to start by talking about this topic a little bit in a general sense. We're all familiar with the urban growth boundary. We're all familiar, most of us anyhow, how it works and so forth and so on. And many people usually talk about land supply in technical language or political language, but they're really talking about should we or shouldn't we? How many acres? What year? Do we really need it? Should we do the east side? Should we do the west side? You know, what cities want it? What cities don't? Those sorts of topics. Um, you can read about that in the paper. Uh, what I was going to talk about today is more about the psychology of the people who are involved in residential land supply. What they tend to be thinking and feeling when they're engaged in the work that they do. <clears throat> some of them are paid professionals like myself. Some of them are volunteers for local governments. Some of them are opponents. Some of them are in the real estate industry. And they all come to the table with a different perspective and for different reasons. And they tend to be different personality types. And, and this all kind of plays out in the background of what you might read in the paper when it comes to the facts of how many acres, where and when, and so forth. <clears throat> so uh, today I'm going to talk about the players, a little bit about each of them and their types and the, the varying types, and what they bring to the table. And I'm going to start with the public sector folks. And we'll start with the easy one, which are the city engineering people. 
Uh, these are the folks who are responsible for creating the infrastructure for the new communities. <clears throat> and for them, their primary emotional attitude is confidence. Because they know that it can be done. They know it can be built. That's what they do, and they like to do it. They're engineers, they like to build things. What they really need is for everyone else just to relax and provide the funding. And they'll take it from there. Um, I do need to make one exception, which is for transportation planners. Sometimes they are quite alarmed at the possibility of new land being developed and the traffic that that'll generate. And, and with, uh, you know, in all seriousness, they have a tougher nut to crack <clears throat> from the technical point of view. Uh, generally speaking, it's easier to upsize and upgrade your water plant and your sewer plant than it is to upgrade or upsize your intersections or interchanges. Uh, and and certainly not just simpler in a technical sense, but simpler in a political sense. Uh, so uh, the city engineers are, are always very helpful, and I can't think of a single case where we ran into a jurisdiction where the city engineering folks just said, you know, we, we just can't do this, sorry. Uh, they have very much a can-do attitude, which is always uh, appreciated. Uh, for the city planners, for the city planners, their attitude tends to be rigidity. And often that's because they're the people who wrote the plans, and all day long they listen to people bending their ear about why they shouldn't have to follow the plan. <laughs> and, <clears throat> you know, for anyone who's worked in uh, the government, you know, we're in a job where you're interacting with the people, you know what I'm saying. Because, you know, you have this job and you have this program that you're responsible for implementing. And you have people coming in all the time who don't want to follow it. And I'll use a personal example for this one. Uh, last year I submitted plans to the city of Aurora, where I live, for my man cave. And a few days later, the uh, city planner called me and said, you know, Joseph, I can't approve this, it's, it's too tall, it's, it's way too tall. And I was talking about it with my son who said, well, Dad, why don't you just get a variance? Isn't that what you do for a living? <laughs> and I said, yes, it's true, but I'm the chair of the planning commission. I'm supposed to set a good example and follow the rules. And uh, so fortunately, after a few conversations with a city planner, I was able to find a workaround and, and uh, you know, get the building more or less the way I wanted it. Uh, a little additional expense, of course, uh, but nothing fatal uh, and, and no substantial changes to the main part of the structure. Uh, <clears throat> the next group of public officials that I want to speak about are planning commissions and the electeds. Now these are big groups, of course, so, uh, and they're much more diverse, and so they're really all over the map. Um, you'll find some that are uh, very helpful. You'll find some that are zealous in one direction or another. Uh, you'll find some that are boosters. They're really out there trying to recruit new businesses, new investments in their community. Uh, so there is no, sort of classic, stereotypical person in that job the, or, or volunteer position. The tricky thing for those of us trying to do land supply is to try to get them all on the same page. And that, you know, is just a whole other topic that, that's very different uh, beyond, beyond the scope of <laughs> what we can talk about today. We could spend a whole hour talking about those dynamics. Uh, the next group I want to talk about is Metro. Metro's attitude at the moment, from my perspective, is trepidation. Um, their system for adding residential land supply is broken. 
Uh, I think we're nine or ten years now into the, uh, okay, uh, uh, you know, into the urban reserves with uh, not much accomplished, uh, no designations final yet, except for the legislature. So Metro is afraid that the legislature is going to step in and take things into their own hands. They did it in 2013. There are many bills in front of them now. Uh, I thought I'd illustrate this one again with a personal story. I was vacationing in Palm Springs once and was in a little trinket shop and saw these little tot-sized t-shirts with big bold print on them. It said, if mom says no, ask grandma. <clears throat> so when it comes to residential land supply, what's really happening is a lot of people are, are just exhausted and feeling done with Metro after literally decades of trying to get things done. And they're going to the legislature and uh, getting things done. And <clears throat> so Metro's in a, kind of on their heels at the moment. The last uh, public sector type or player that I want to talk about is the hearings officer. Hearings officers are lawyers that are hired by uh, different jurisdictions to make certain land use decisions, including land use decisions about larger subdivisions and so forth and so on. And uh, their primary attitude is detachment. Uh, they just want to get through the hearing and write their decision without bothersome controversy. And the, the remedy for really making them happy is to just speak to the criteria, stick to the facts, um, and they will get it done for you. Uh, almost always very objective, you know, given that they work for and are paid by the local government, uh, they really try hard to steer away from political controversies. Uh, and, and so they're very helpful uh, to everyone, I think, for that purpose. <clears throat> then on the private sector, I'm going to start with the vacant property landowners. So these are the people on the edge of cities and towns who are sitting on large acreage. Uh, many of them are anxious to sell. And their primary attitude is frustration. Uh, oftentimes they've been told for many years by public officials, you know, don't worry, we're working on it, your land is going to be brought into the UGB or brought into the city. Uh, <clears throat> they've been um, <clears throat> wined and dined by investors and developers who are interested in buying their land. But they essentially are teased because <clears throat> people keep saying these things year after year after year, but it doesn't seem to happen. And the developers aren't quite ready to write checks yet. And, and that's a, a, a bitter pill for people who uh, are on the edge. You know, that maybe they've seen the neighbors across the street or up the road who were able to sort of get this done and move on uh, with the next chapter of their lives, and they feel kind of in limbo as they're waiting and waiting and waiting. <clears throat> then opposite the landowners, of course, are the developers. And their attitude is often not, Kent, Kent's such a happy-go-lucky guy. <clears throat> But their attitude is often one of agitation. And they're frustrated because their business model, which is to buy vacant land, hire contractors, build houses and sell houses, is illegal. Okay? They just can't get it done in any kind of a prompt way. That's very agitating to them because they know they've got a willing landowner, they know they've got willing contractors, they know there are willing home buyers out there in the marketplace, but because somebody has drawn lines on a map that excludes it, you know, they're, they're kind of boxed out. And that's, that's very agitating for them. Uh, for the investors, and by investor I mean uh, 
people who aren't actually going to do the work that folks like Kent does, but people who uh, are long-term property buyers or long-term lenders. Uh, some people would call them speculators. Okay, uh, Their primary attitude is anxiety. And the reason for that is that the collateral, either for a loan or the asset that they own in their own portfolio, the value of that varies dramatically. Uh, in my own community, uh, some of you may know this, but we're a uh, city of Aurora, where I'm chair of planning commission. We're considering uh, an urban growth boundary expansion to take in the Aurora airport. So right now, if you look at the county assessor's valuations, the land that's outside the boundary of the airport is worth $10,000 an acre, and the land inside the boundary of the airport is $130,000 an acre. So if you're invested in those kind of acres, the value of your investment you know, is up or down uh, 13 times. And it's, it's really important to emphasize that most all of the other states don't have a situation like this. Um, another story, I've been involved very much in South Hillsboro, uh, which is one of these areas where the legislature stepped in uh, in 2013. And uh, we've been involved with three major property owners who own uh, the majority of the land there. And one of the owners is not a client of the firm, but we, the three developers cooperated very closely to get a lot of things done. And uh, this was uh, some out-of-town folks who, in the 1990s, bought a portfolio of 30 properties throughout the West uh, out of a uh, bankruptcy. And this was the last property uh, to become entitled by eight years, and, and they just were astonished, and it was sort of very anticlimactic. You know, these people had bought these 30 properties as an investment, planned to sell them off more or less promptly, as soon as they could, uh, get a value add in there, and then this was the last straggler in the portfolio, uh, eight years behind any other property around the West. <clears throat> but they have broken ground now, and uh, probably most of next year will be, <clears throat> or most of this season, this summer building season, will still be infrastructure. And uh, you can expect to see lots of housing and uh, some apartments and some commercial coming online out in South Hillsboro in 2018. Uh, the next group I'm going to talk about <clears throat> is people like me and consultants. People hire us to get their entitlements. And the attitude that we feel is constrained. <clears throat> and the reason for that is that we have got clients that want X and we have governments that want Y. And so we're forever trying to work within the limits of the client's business plan and the codes or rules that are set up by the governments. It's our job to pull all those things together and find solutions that everybody can live with. Even Maybe they're not always happy with it, but that everybody can live with. Uh, it's the ever-elusive win-win. And uh, when it comes to residential land supply, and we're talking about you know, boundary expansions and annexations, uh, sometimes rezones, <clears throat> it, it really comes down to, is the land buildable? You know, can, can we get a permit? What's the permit for? What's it going to cost? Those sorts of <clears throat> topics. Those are the primary players uh, that you see interacting, meeting in, meeting out, hearing in, hearing out. But there's other folks involved. Uh, folks who are supporters, they include home buyers. And 
you'll never see them usually at a public hearing or a public meeting because they don't know who they are. They don't know of the project. The project isn't being marketed yet. And I, I've often said to hearings bodies that, you know, I wish I could fill some of these seats with the people that we're going to sell homes and lease apartments to. But they don't know us. We haven't met them yet. We know we're going to meet them in next year or the year after. We're going to do a transaction. We hope they're happy with it. But unfortunately, they can't be with us here tonight. Uh, what is the home buyer's perspective in today's market? It's dismay. You know, they have limited choices. The prices are very high. And when it comes to buying new product, uh, the choices are very limited. Uh, especially in the metro area, the types of lots <clears throat> that can be built uh, is pretty limited. Uh, the types of blocks and neighborhoods, pretty limited. So for example, uh, here, you know, up on the hill, if you look north of Warner Milne Road, you'll see a neighborhood, maybe 60s, early 70s style neighborhood. Large lots, uh, narrow, relatively undeveloped streets, just, you know, an asphalt street, no curb, gutter, sidewalk, street trees, all the modern trimmings. Uh, long blocks, you know, many cul-de-sacs. That type of neighborhood is essentially illegal now and has been for many, many years. Uh, so if you want a new house and you want a large lot, you know, you're not really going to find it in a city in the metro area. Uh, there's this constant push for more density, more density, more density. And I'll be the first to admit, and, you know, we see it at all uh, ranges of the market, from McMansions to mobile home parks and everything in between. There are lots of people out there who want more house on a smaller lot. They just want a place for their barbecue and a swing set, and they don't need anything more. So that is the majority of the current buyer. I'm just trying to get across, there isn't the choice. There isn't the flexibility to do the type of neighborhood where you could have a larger lot. Another density issue, you know, is this cul-de-sac issue. The codes now all require a gridded system of streets. Great. That's one way to do it. When you do a gridded system of streets, it takes a lot more real estate and a lot more pavement on any given site. So how does that play out for the home buyer? Uh, the home buyer can't have the quiet street, the cul-de-sac, which are especially popular with people with young children. You get fewer lots on the land, so the cost of the land per house is higher. And then because you have to put in all these extra streets, you have to pay much more up front for that pavement and everything else that goes with the street, even though you have fewer lots with which to support that infrastructure. So that's an important choice that used to be there for developers and families in decades past that is not there anymore. And that's, that's, frustrating. that's frustrating for the person who wants to live in that kind of neighborhood and wants a new house. If anyone knows of a new neighborhood where you can have those amenities, let me know. <clears throat> Another group of supporters is local businesses, and I assume there are many folks like this in our audience tonight. Um, retail follows rooftops when residential land supply is made available and new homes are put up and occupied. That supports local businesses of all types, not just retail, even though that's uh, sort of perhaps the most direct one. In the context here of Oregon City, 
Uh, I think many of you know I've been working for Rose and her family lately on annexation of the golf course, which is designated for residential. Immediately north of there, of course, is this large area designated for industrial unemployment. Uh, the people who are hiring employees obviously want a place for those employees to be able to live close by. So the two go hand in hand, uh, but you'll always find local businesses in support of residential land supply. If somebody sees that otherwise, I'd, again, be happy to hear that. The last group I'm going to talk about is the opponents. The opponents come in several categories. The first one I'm going to talk about is housing advocates. And their psychology tends to be one of indignation. They are frustrated by the lack of options for people at the lower end of the economic scale in terms of modest houses, modest apartments, and they feel in their core that that is a problem that we all should be working harder on. The solution from their point of view is often one of two things or a combination of the two things. Um, from the public sector side, they're forever pressing for more public housing investment. Section 8 programs, SDC credits, there's a variety of public financing mechanisms that can be done to increase the supply of affordable housing. <clears throat> From the private sector, they push for things like rent control, mandatory inclusionary housing, which basically means if you're building a larger product, uh, you have to include some units that are designed and will be sold to people of modest means. The next <clears throat> uh, opponent that I want to talk about are the NIMBYs. And their basic psychology is one of alarm. They are alarmed at this new project, what it's going to do for noise, what it's going to do for traffic. Um, the only way to really make them happy is to deny the application, just say no. And the same is often true for what we call the professional opponents. These are nonprofit groups who uh, challenge projects, that's what they do. Uh, they just say no from their perspective the solution is to not have an increase in residential land supply. They see growing suburbs as the problem, not as the solution. So uh, many of these folks are, are strong advocates of urban living. They believe urban living is a better way for people to live. They believe it's better for the environment uh, and, and reasons like that but they are very adamant that more single-family housing is just a big mistake, and for that reason, they do what they can to delay it, make it more expensive, oppose it, deny it, and those sorts of things. <clears throat> In summary, I'd like to pull it back more locally here to the city of Oregon City. And I noted, uh, sitting in a hearing a few weeks ago, that the very first goal for the City Commission's goals for 2015 to 17 is to maintain an environment for successful economic development. And so now I'm going to pull up a slide. This is some data that Laura provided. Thank you. Uh, the blue bars are the city population, and the red line is the number of lots applied for. So as the city continues to grow, you might think in a perfect world the number of lots would sort of be on a steady. Well, the real estate market doesn't go that way. This ziggity-zaggity thing looks very similar to other lines that you'll see in other communities around here or for Metro. Uh, but what is interesting to me is that, and this data is only good through 14, so it's probably picked up a little bit more in the last couple of years, would you say, Laura? 
But still, the long-term average, you know, we're still well below the amount of new housing lots that were provided 20 years ago when the population was substantially less. So even though our population is growing slowly and steadily, uh, the supply of lots and land for lots is not. It's substantially below historic averages. And again, not just here in Oregon City, you'll see the same is true uh, on a region-wide basis for Metro. Uh, that's really the conclusion of my remarks today. Uh, I would encourage you all, when you look at charts like this, and when you read about these issues, again, think about who's involved, think about what they're thinking, think about why they're thinking it, and ask yourself, what can I do if you're in the game? You know, what can I do to understand these people better? Because they may not be articulating what they're really feeling, but if you can try to understand their perspective a little bit better, it might make a little progress for everyone. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take some questions. Uh, and if anybody does have a question, I'll go ahead and bring the microphone out to you so we can hear the question clearly. Okay, let's start over here. Joseph, first of all, thank you very much for being here. It was really informative to hear that perspective of the personalities involved in all of this. I think at uh, the last uh, Planning Commission meeting I testified at, I, I coined a new phrase. In, in addition to NIMBY, I contended there's a new acronym we can use called the STUDBEES. The STUDBEES are standing for shut the door behind you. They've got theirs, and they don't think that anybody else should get theirs because, um, because they just want to shut the door behind them. There's not a reason for it. It's just that they've got it, and when they bought that land, there was all this countryside around them, and that's the way they think it ought to stay forever. It reminds me of the, the, uh, the reason that, uh, uh, that, um, that a man marries a woman ex expecting her to never change. And the woman marries a man expecting she can change him, and neither one of them work. <laughs> um, I did have a question about the um, about the graph over here, just because I, I happen to be a professional cynic, and I'm always suspicious of, of numbers and graphs. As to far as what this is showing us, rather than showing the population, it seems to me as though showing the density, the city density, uh, per uh, per year and how that is growing. Are we becoming more dense? Because it seems to be, there's gotta be a physical limit as to how many lots there are available. Uh, what did, was it uh, Will Rogers said, you know, invest in real estate, they're not making any more of it? <laughs> Except in Hawaii, of course, where they build their own islands. Um, but the idea is, isn't there gonna be some limit as to how much land you can develop on without expanding the UGB? And please address the question of, if you can't annex land that's already in the UGB, how can Metro expect that to be considered part of a developable inventory? Okay, you asked a couple of questions there. Uh, the first one about density, and I think the answer is yes. I don't have statistics for you on multifamily units. Uh, again, Laura, uh, maybe you or someone else from the city could, could fill that in. But obviously, if the population growth is going up and the number of new lots is, is not keeping pace, either you're getting more apartments, or presumably you are getting more apartments, uh, you may also have a lot of doubling up happening. The number of households often shrinks in a recession. So it's probably a combination of both those factors. Okay. Uh, to answer your question on Metro and the inventory, um, so Metro has a lot of what some people call phantom inventory, which is 
you know, areas that they've mapped and they say, well, there's housing capacity here, but nobody can actually build on it. This is sort of what I was expressing before about developers feeling agitated that the, what they want to do is against the law. They're constantly being told, well, yes, we have a 20-year land supply. It's over in Damascus. Knock yourself out. <laughs> and that's not going to solve the problem. <laughs> that's, that's for sure. No, I'll bring it this microphone so that way. Uh, we'll just be there, and Aaron Boy here. Well, thank you very much, and I don't quarrel with anything you said. Um, I do. We'll throw out one thing. One of the um, groups you didn't identify generally is the public at large. You did say the home buyers, which is the public, <clears throat> but uh, it seems to me that there's this mantra that the public has bought into about maintaining sprawl and maintaining the protection of our um, in, you know, our landscape and whatever euphemism we apply to that. And I don't think they connect the relationship between that mantra and the cost of housing um, and, and the commute time and so on. But that's another story. Here's my question to you. Um, and it's, I'm not being facetious. If you were the king or the dictator and you could rule out all of those um, attitudes that you just addressed – and you want to address the problem of housing cost, which relates to supply, I presume. <clears throat> but what is the magic bullet? What would you do to fix the problem that we have a shortage of housing, we have a shortage of options, and we have a, an abundance of price? Whether you were talking at 150% of the federal poverty level or whether you're talking about... Um, a 35-year-old household making $100,000 household, which can't buy the house that I live in today. I can't buy the house I live in today that I bought in 1981. So how do you fix the problem? Well, when I was in seventh grade, they taught us about the law of supply and demand, and I've never seen anybody successfully explain that that law is not correct. So... Uh, I don't think there's any way to get around increasing the supply. Uh, for the single family context, you need land. Uh, you also need land for the multifamily context. In the multifamily context, um, the least expensive multifamily to build is two or three story wood frame, surface parking. You've all seen those kind of complexes. That is a well established model for affordable multifamily housing, but it takes a lot of land, okay? Uh, the other piece is that we can reduce the cost, okay? So land is the most expensive factor in a new house or a new apartment, uh, but it's not the only one, okay? Um, codes, infrastructure, all costs money. Okay. South Hillsboro, which I referenced before, SDCs for a house are about $45,000. Okay. Now, why are those so high? Um, because they're starting from scratch. You know, South Hillsboro has 1,400 acres of more or less bare land. Okay. And so they're kind of going from zero to 90 in one step. All new streets, all new water, sewer, parks. So it's very expensive. But part of that are things that are being demanded, such as concrete streets. I and mean, don't get me wrong, I love concrete. I think it's a great material. You can make it into any shape you want. It's very strong, lasts forever, etc. But if there is to be a solution, it has to include some help from the public when it comes to the long list of very expensive conditions that come with your approvals. And I just might make a comment that as we've gone through this transition from boom rears, as you can see on the graph, when the amount of lots that was exceeding the population prior to 2006, we had a very active and trained workforce in the residential development community. Once the, the Great Recession hit, a lot of those individuals that had been skilled laborers that were available had to go find new professions. 
because uh, there just wasn't any demand. You could not finance any projects any longer. So one of the things that's adding to the cost of a new home now is just the fact that we don't have that labor force available to go ahead and keep up with this, the demand for the product in our communities. So we're having to pay higher wages because of the limited supply. And you've, we've heard this mentioned before in some of our seminars. Uh, Rob, I know you're working with a lot of people at the community college to try to get them the proper skills. Plumbers, welders, now these people can make over $100,000 a year because there's such a huge demand for that type of skill set. Um, Martha, I'm glad you were able to come in here because I know that you and Sonia participated in the Stafford Hamlet uh, outreach event with the community on the 13th of this month. Again, without the land supply there to go ahead and keep up with this endless amount of demand that keeps moving to the metropolitan region, we're gonna have even fewer options to choose from. And it, it's the vocal minority that seems to get all the attention at the public hearings. It's not the silent majority. And I don't envy either one of you trying to figure out how you're going to bring all that together, but that is a big component of our land use supply for this particular part of Clackamas County. Damascus, as we all know, is not going to happen. Happy Valley is moving further east and is going to absorb a big portion of that, but we have to have uh, homes close to where people have their jobs too. And not everybody can keep moving further and further east that direction. It needs to be closer to where everything can be within a very close driving distance. So I, I know, Lou, you mentioned what's the magic bullet? What, what is the solution? Uh, I'm gonna add one more. Uh, which is that time is money. And uh, Kent could explain better than I, but the folks that are actually doing this have to spend a huge amount of money on interest. And the quicker they can get through the entitlement process and get their building started, the less goes to the banks, which comes out of the pockets of the tenants in a multifamily context or the buyers in a single family context. It's a hidden cost that nobody sees. Everybody expects the landowners and the developers just to be patient, you'll get through it but every month they're writing a check to the lender. Uh, and those are big checks. Uh, and they really hurt. Uh, I'll give you an example. I've got a project going on now in Portland. Uh, it's a redevelopment site. The existing uh, site is a parking lot in a building, old building that's been converted to parking. And we were going through these elaborate contortions to keep the building there as long as possible. And there's people involved for various reasons that want the building to come down, but the person doing the project is desperately trying to keep the building up just so he can make the interest payments. Got a question over here, Jerry? This is a question and also a statement. I wonder if people know that uh, David Rockefeller died this week, actually early last week. David Rockefeller and Tom McCall stood at Willamette Falls and also by the Blue Heron Paper Company Mill, then called Smurfit, discussing land use issues on the East Coast and the West Coast and the cleanup of two rivers, the Willamette and the Hudson. The reason I bring this up is Tom McCall's whole vision. He started all this, am I wrong? Land use planning in Oregon. Senate Bill 100. He had Bob Straub, a Democrat. He had Stafford Hansel, a strong Republican <clears throat> pig farmer from Hermiston, and others uh, working with him, LB Day, to start this process. And I'm going to paraphrase what he said. On your table, by the way, there's a flyer where we're going to look at this stuff on Saturday. April Fools, no fooling. We're going to talk about what Tom McCall and others said at that location at the Blue Heron plant as we do a walking tour. He said, Tom McCall said, this action should be interactive, should allow people to cooperate, and most importantly, should not require professional interpretation. There's a commissioner in this county I used to know very well, Larry Soa. He was a part of starting Senate Bill 100 in Oregon, and he said to me, 
Jerry, if we don't get a handle on this, it's going to become an industry trying to interpret the law. It has to be what Tom McCall said, interactive and personal. What would you say to that? Uh, I would say what he feared came true. Um, sometimes people ask me what I do for a living, and I say, I'm an interpreter. And they say, oh, what languages do you speak? And I say, oh, I speak traffic. I speak architecture. I speak annexation. I speak water and sewer. That's what I do. I, that's my job. I mean, all these people that I described to you in the talk earlier, those are all the people I have to interact with all the time and bring them all together. It's an you know, often repeated criticism, but you start with a simple concept and it gets complicated. Somebody asks a question that doesn't fit into the paradigm and nobody knows the answer. So maybe they build something that somebody doesn't like and the next year they come back and they write a rule that says you can't do it that way. And the next year they write a few more rules and the next year they write a few more rules. And now if you look up the rules, uh, I mean, a, a terrific example. Um, I'm not sure what year it was. Might have been 13. The legislature passed a bill that said, we're going to have a simplified UGB expansion. Okay. So the rule is, I think, 21 pages, single-spaced, small font. Okay, that's the simple UGB method. So I'll try to be briefer than William. Uh, simple question. So when we have these, what you call professional protesters or, you know, appellants, um, that don't really have an axe to grind in our community, how, to, how, how can we fix that problem? I get the fact that if you have somebody that's in Oregon City that wants to appeal a project for whatever personal reason, they should have the opportunity to do that. But folks outside of Oregon City, um, you know, whether it's Beaver Creek or Salem or LeGrand, shouldn't have the ability to appeal projects to Luba from Oregon City. How do we fix that? Uh, to fix that, you would need to go to the legislature. It's something uh, that the lawyers call standing, which basically means who has the right to bring a case. Okay, uh, I don't have the right to sue you because of a real estate dispute unless I'm your neighbor and you're you know, encroaching on my property line or something. Um, but if you decide to put an addition on your house, you're exactly right. There's nothing that restricts me from contacting Laura or Pete and say, hey, I'm interested in this, I don't like it, I think it's ugly, I think it violates the rules, if you approve it, I'm gonna you know, tie it up forever. So uh, it's an open door policy to everyone uh, that's set up in uh, ORS 197. It's very inexpensive uh, and so it gets abused. I might add that there were a group of us that were working with the legislature this year to go ahead and draft a frivolous Luba uh, lawsuit bill so that it wasn't so simple for someone to just go ahead and file an appeal of a land use decision because they didn't like it. The fees are very, very small, and this can tie a project up, as Joseph was talking about, time is money. And if you have a fairly sizable project that you're making interest payments on to your bank, and that loan is coming due at a certain date, you have to be able to move forward on that project. And that person that's filing that frivolous appeal knows that also. And so we didn't get any traction in the legislature this year, which kind of surprised me. Uh, but we're going to continue to work on it and start out earlier next year and hopefully get that at least to the floor for a vote. Um, saw another hand out there. Over here. A similar concern about the opponents. Um, it seems that there aren't very well-spoken 
proponents. Um, we've got the land developers and you know potential investors and things like that, and they've all been painted as money-hungry people who are you know just trying to get theirs off of the land. Um, how do we get? proponents that are able to tell the homeowner, because you've mentioned all these people that are working for voters, how do we tell the voters that when you say you don't want to see urban growth, that means that when the lot is sold next to you, three more have to go in there? How do you tell the stubbies that um, close the door behind me means that your son is going to be living in the basement? How do we get a better... Um, I, I don't know, a better positive news to the voter message. Yes. Tell them to come to the Oregon City Business Alliance forums. <laughs> <laughs> well, something I've done, and, and privately, not in a public hearing contest, is simply to ask the person making that remark, where do they live? You know, they live in a house, or an apartment, or a condo. Uh, somebody develop that house. Somebody made noise building that house. Somebody left a pile of trash out front when they were building that house, and a windy day came and blew stuff all over the place. It's a difficult psychological thing. None of us want to imagine that what we do has an adverse impact on others. The core of planning, really, is to help people understand that what they're doing does impact others. And different types of land uses and different types of activities have different impacts. And as planners, we try to juggle all those things at the same time. Certainly, sometimes things fall and break, but we're trying to balance all of that. and. I usually find that the person who's most adamant about these sorts of complaints, they've already got theirs. You know, uh, you really, <clears throat> they do. A, a second point that I would make is that, you know, we're constantly trying to encourage supporters to come to public meetings and come to public hearings. I've had many developer clients who encourage their contractors to come to a meeting and say, you know what this project means for me. I can hire five guys, I can employ them for eight months, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, one of the knocks on this type of work is, well, these are just temporary jobs. Okay, A construction job is a temporary job. It's a short term. It's not... It's not like a real permanent job. Well, you know, for the people in the industry, uh, they understand that very well. Uh, but they want the work. They like to build things. It's hard to get them to come and participate, uh, but when they do, it can be very effective. Yeah, thanks, Joseph. Um, maybe maybe a, a, a group, a couple uh, that you uh, did not include are uh, uh, federal groups and uh, Corps of Engineers, the National Wildlife Fisheries Service, and some of the rules that they've uh, put forth that would, uh, in their lawsuit against FEMA for, uh, uh, quote, encouraging development inside the 100-year floodplain, unquote, and trying to expand uh, uh, fisheries habitat to uh, the natural course of rivers. Um, uh, do you see, I just appreciate some comments you might have about their impact on lands. Um, I've come to recently learn that wetland doesn't necessarily have to have a pond or even standing water on it to be uh, a wetland. Um, uh, uh, can you comment on that? And, and do you, the other, th I've got kind of two big questions, because the other one is the usefulness of the, the, uh, the Oregon's land use planning um, uh, laws that was approaching 40 years old now. And one of the unintended consequences that I think I've seen of that is leapfrog development, where pe and, and, and now people are forced to drive 
greater distances uh, uh, just so they can achieve affordability. And the type of house that you described earlier where they need for their family that they cannot obtain, you know, on a close in. So anyway, thank you. Uh, yes, the federal government, even though they don't regulate land use, quote unquote, uh, they do regulate land use in a couple of different ways indirectly. The one you're referring to, it all kind of flows from the Clean Water Act. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, I guess about eight or ten years ago now, uh, some uh, fish groups sued uh, FEMA uh, in Seattle for the Puget Sound, basically saying that the way FEMA allowed people to develop in the floodplain uh, was harming salmon. Uh, and you can actually develop in the floodplain. You, uh, it's strictly regulated, but in many cases, if you just fill a little bit or a lot of bit, uh, you can get your permit to fill in the floodplain. And uh, so the case was that, hey, you know, FEMA, you're not helping the endangered species. You're harming the endangered species, so you ought to stop. That case got settled about mm, four or five years ago. And FEMA basically agreed, okay, we're going to change the way we do business. We are going to stop uh, issuing development permits in the floodplain, going to make it a lot harder for people to fill in the floodplain. And uh, we're going to, I'm trying to, it's not really we're going to expand the floodplain so much on the maps. But what we're going to do is start accounting for what they call the channel migration zone. In many places, rivers move quite a bit over time. And we've been in the habit of mapping our setbacks and so forth from where the river is whenever they make the map. And so now they're changing that to look at where the river not just is today, but where it used to be and where it's likely to be in another 40 or 60 or 80 years. And they're going to regulate that whole area. So that's certainly a large um, uh, restriction on land supply. The other piece of this is the uh, waters of the United States rule, <clears throat> which is just that. Which waters are going to be regulated by the federal government? There's been a lot of case law on it. Obama pushed one rule through. Trump, I think, has sort of said, no, we're not going to do it that way. Uh, but it really comes down to what is the federal government interested in. Now, in our context out here on the left coast, we still have, we still have state level regulation of the same thing. Okay. So I don't want anyone to get the impression that if uh, you know, Trump or some other administration lightens up on federal rules, that's going to free up a lot of land because that land is likely um, subject to rules from Department of Ecology in Washington or uh, Department of State Lands down here in Oregon. And yes, you're correct. The definition of a wetland does not require standing water. It's more complicated than that. Uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of wetlands out there. It's easy for people to be surprised by them. They go on site tours in the dry season, if we have a dry season. <laughs> yeah, and, and they, lo and behold, they find out later that there's not as much land available uh, as they had thought. And then remind me your second question. <laughs> Do I see any of that changing? No. I, I don't. Uh, water is a precious resource. People are very uh, focused on keeping it clean. Uh, they are uh, very confident that the best thing they can do to keep that clean is to preserve buffers of whatever you know length. They vary in different contexts. But uh, those are all restrictions on the availability of land, and I don't see them going away. I would encourage anyone who hasn't seen them to look at the historic maps of Oregon City. Uh, you'll see a lot of the riverfront that you can walk and drive on today that you think is sort of nice, flat land. Um, you know, historically, you know, not so.
Mine is just a comment, not a question. A couple things. We were at the Capitol yesterday, and I will tell you, you really want to encourage your um, representatives to be getting this transportation bill passed. Because in addition to waiting on interest, you're waiting on trucks to deliver the goods to get the product. They're sitting and sitting and sitting in traffic and having a very difficult time. And you're going to see a huge material cost increase in the next couple of years. We're seeing it in all of our trade magazines. Material costs are going up like crazy. And so it's not just the cost um, of the land and the SDCs and everything. The material costs are going up. And then, of course, we are desperately short on labor. And one of the things, Measure 98 passed, and now they're trying to tackle how they're going to start getting more CTE programs in the schools. But we definitely need more CTE programs in the schools um, to get trained labor. So anyway, the, and I grew up in a town that refused to let business in. And so it's been, I've been gone 30 years and there's still about the same number of people living there. And guess what? All the good talent leaves the town and all of the people that stay, unfortunately, there's a lot of divorce, drugs, single parenting, and a lot that comes, a lot that comes with not having jobs because there's no jobs, so. Thank you. I couldn't agree more on the transportation. When the oil and gas prices collapsed a couple of years ago, I was like, guys, raise the taxes. Now's your chance. Um, I don't understand why it didn't happen. Time is money, whether it's a trucker trying to get from point A to point B, or you or me trying to get to work. Um, I got a great Jabra hands-free Bluetooth phone that I highly recommend to people. Uh, spend a little extra money, your voice will be much clearer, you'll be much more productive while you're waiting in traffic. Um, Nick, I remembered your second question, which had to do with people who can't find what they're looking for in the metro area housing market going further out. And absolutely, out in the exurbs, anywhere around, uh, you can go to Estacada, Sandy, Woodburn, Silverton, Malala, over on the west side. You can go to Newburgh, McMinnville. Uh, and then, of course, Clark County is, you know, example A. So, yes, many people are, you know, giving up and just moving further out than they would otherwise like to be. I was just going to make a follow-up comment, Joseph, to your statement that some of the opponents to seeing growth occur is that residential only creates temporary positions. And then once the house is built, uh, th that skilled worker is no longer employed. Well, the truth of the matter is there's a huge ripple effect when a new home is built of other individuals that are employed to provide them with a washing machine, uh, furniture to fill the rooms, draperies to cover the windows, um, cleaning the gutters. I just had our roof uh, power washed last year because it really needed a bad. Well, then that particular individual's company was able to do several other homes in our neighborhood uh, because they said, hey, I'm, I need the same work here. So there is continued employment that takes place after the people take occupancy of the home. I read an article um, in one of the Builder magazines recently because there has been such a, a, a challenge to get projects through the pipeline that it's cost our U.S. economy $300 billion dollars and lost um, revenue that these other industries that benefit from home ownership have not been able to provide their product to. And so it's, it's critical to keep the whole machine greased if we really want to get people back to work. Just to tag on to the end of that, I just uh, posted uh, your picture on Facebook. And so those of you that aren't on Facebook uh, or that, that haven't uh, liked the Oregon City Business Alliance uh, Facebook page, please take a look at that. But one of, the, one of the takeaways that I put in my post that you had mentioned follows what he said is that, uh, I hope I quoted you correctly, retail follows rooftops. Uh, I hadn't heard that phrase before. That was brilliant. Yeah. And Ken, I would just comment, 
and that your point is really reflected in this graph, and there's something that we've talked about a little bit, but I'm going to talk about it more specifically here, which is the cycle of developing land. Okay, Most developers try to keep a five to seven year supply of land and lots in their pipeline because ultimately the customer wants a house. Okay, The customer doesn't care if the house took five years or 10 years or five minutes to build. They just want a finished house, okay? But unfortunately, it takes five years. Now, imagine you're a guy like Kent and you're trying to look ahead five or seven years and you're not sure whether you're gonna be here or here or here, okay? So, in terms of keeping the system greased, okay, if they can at least predict how long it's going to take them to get their land supply and get their permits and be able to build a house. That really helps. Okay. Anybody else? Going once? Going twice? Oh, my better half has decided to bless me with her presence today. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for all your interesting comments and uh, I'm curious with what we've been going through with uh, such a strict land use um, situation in Oregon what do you see Oregon looking like 20 or 30 years from now is it going to be a lot of high density uh, versus single family homes you know there's so many people coming into our state but we're not able to satisfy that Uh, my own view is that it's a generational thing, that you've got the generation that created the land use system and they're not so young anymore. And you've got a new generation that is... Well, let me give you an example. One of the guys I used to work with uh, teaches the land use law class at Willamette Law School and was uh, remarking to me that, you know, these young people... They just see it very differently. You know, they want their houses. They can't afford their houses. They've got a mountain of student debt, so the mortgage broker's telling them, uh, and, and they want houses. So uh, I think something's going to give. It's starting to give at the legislature a little bit. But yes, it'll be more dense, you know, because uh, folks like me who'd rather have a smaller house on a larger lot, we're really the minority. Uh, there's going to be more people in apartments. There's going to be more people in townhouses. Uh, but there's still going to be a very substantial number of families that want a house with a yard. So there's, there's going to be all kinds. But yes, it'll be more dense. And that's not just a Portland thing. You know, you can see it in markets all around the country. All right. Well, uh, if there's no any other questions, I just want to thank Joseph for his presentation today. You enlightened us with some amazing insights as to what each part of the the, the equation and bringing together a project to fruition is in, inclusive of. Uh, now the the key is what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? How are we going to reach out to the community and have people that are supportive of? our causes really stand up and let their voices be heard. It bothers me so much at public hearings, as I said earlier, it's the vocal minority that seems to get the most attention. And if we could just have a half a dozen people come and support developments as it's going through that land use process, it would make such a difference in being able to get things accomplished. So share with your friends, share with your neighbors. If you're uh, in a community that is having a land use action take place, attend the neighborhood association meeting and participate so that the developer or the property owner, the applicant, whoever the case may be, knows you're there to support them. And we'll see positive things happen. I'm excited about Oregon City because we do have a new law that was signed by the governor last year that now allows the three concept plans to go forward through the approval process, uh, through the planning commission and the city commission. And Rose, you and I, we've been involved with this since 2002. Uh, Mayor Holiday talked about it in the state of the city address, how long we were uh, putting our uh, opportunities onto the ballot 
and how many times we were defeated. So fortunately, that no longer is the case. So that should help in that supply of land and affordability as those projects come onto the market. So not, it's not all doom and gloom. There is some bright spots on the horizon here in Oregon City, but that may not be the case everywhere else. But I appreciate your, uh, your presentation today, Joseph. Thank you. Thank you.